Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the second talk today. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, our speaker, Jörg Schmalian, Professor Jörg Schmalian from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Um, so, can you help me or somebody else how to get these slides there? So, oh, oh wonderful. Okay. This looks better. Mm -hmm. So Alex was fighting with the machine here. So this is going backwards. Backwards. So going forward. Uh -huh. And the pointer. If you keep hold and uh, press and hold it, press and hold. It oh, wonderful! Excellent. Uh, now I'm well trained. Um, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I already forgot what I have to do here. Good. Um, uh, the work I will be presenting was done with a number of wonderful collaborators. Um, it started, in fact, uh, with Ilya Estelis. Um, who back then was still a graduate student and now goes on to get a faculty position um, in uh, medicine um, and with Konrad Skalm from uh, Leiden uh, and uh, students uh, and a postdoc from Karlsruhe uh, with whom the work was done together with. And um, essentially um, it was all because of um, uh, um, Alexei Kamis, uh, Kamenis fault because Dima Bagrets, one of his collaborators, came to Karlsruhe and talked about their work, the one he just presented. And uh, I asked myself, so I want to see if this branch cut fermion that we've just seen becomes superconducting. What happens uh, if such a system becomes superconducting during this talk? And then uh, we started talking about this. Um, so I will give a little bit of a motivation. Um, um, what is the experimental background that uh, drove some of our considerations. Um, then we will talk about a toy model that is as the SYK model just presented a version of it as ridiculous as the one that was presented and as beautiful as the one that was presented. Um, and we will try to solve it. Uh, we will do so with the clear conscience that this is a simple toy model but we will then also see that making some progress along those lines will help us to understand actual critical Fermi surfaces. Um, that is uh, a question that was posed early on. So let's, however, uh, talk about um, the motivation. There are certain things about, say, really complicated superconductors, such as the high TC superconductor that we actually understand. So if we want to talk with the positive note, we understand that there are, for example, D-wave superconductors. We understand uh, that the phase diagram is a mess, but we also understand that they form boogaloo of quasi particles. So, this is a photo emission result here, long ago taken by the Argon group, where you see the dispersion and the backwards bending as you would expect it for a um, boogaloo of a quasi particle in the BCS type of theory. Um, uh, so, uh, the ground state to some extent has to have some overlap with the BCS wave function in some uh, well-defined uh, way. And uh, if you then, however, look at this, at this boogaloo of quasi-particle, you notice also that it has its own um, subtleties and uh, interesting aspects. So this is, a, again, a spectrum, photo emission spectrum taken, again, many, many years ago, uh, where you see a very, very broad peak uh, in the spectrum. And in the superconducting state, you see um, as this coherent peak emergent, which is our dispersing boogaloo of quasi particle. The thing that you should observe here is that um, its spectral weight is actually tiny. Um, so, whatever is done there in the superconducting only grabs a small portion of the spectral weight of the system and changes it, transforms it, uh, which is at least something noticeable. You can um, also make very nice connections on a phenomenological level with this uh, 
with this weight that we've just seen here as function of certain parameters in the chemistry of the system. And you see that the superfluid stiffness, which is at least not the least important quantity of a superconductor, actually is correlated to it in one way or another. Um, in fact, there's even the condensation energy, as say hard it might be to define this sharply, but uh, obtained here from heat capacity extrapolations and so forth, also seems to be correlating in some way with this coherent weight. So there's something to be said about these superconductors which are forming out of a normal state that is very, very incoherent. Um, and the message that I'm trying to bring across is one of the aspects that is unique is that they have a very small Bogolyubov of quasi particle weight. Um, another aspect of superconductivity, which doesn't have to be related to one I've just discussed, is quantum criticality. Um, it also happens to occur in a number of systems here. These are heavy fermion materials, cerium palladium to silicon two or cerium indium three, where you have a magnetic phase. The magnetic phase disappears uh, here by pressurizing the material and at low temperatures where the system seems to be disappearing in its ordered state, superconductivity is taking place. Uh, and this happens also here in charge transfer salts of the organic variety. Uh, where you have a density wave instability disappears and you have a superconducting instability. This is an iron based superconductor. You have um, a certain magnetically ordered state, it disappears here, there's chemical composition changed. Uh, and again, wherever you are suppressing the ordered state, you seem to have a superconductivity that is even largest. Um, there are some statements made about coup rates and quantum criticality. I am not entirely convinced that this is experimentally really the case there is something interesting there um, but uh, clearly in these systems i think uh, the the argument in favor of quantum criticality does exist so this is to some extent surprising um, because if you recall um, how do we get to superconductivity uh, one way to do so is by just uh, assuming a fermi liquid uh, and uh, realizing that indeed superconductivity, as many of us know, is a completely natural ground state of a Fermi liquid. So if I have a Fermi liquid, I have a single pole in my propagator, uh, I can characterize this in a certain way with say a self energy. Um, I'm then summing up the diagrams that uh, at least in some well-defined logarithmic sense are dominating in the system. And I'm looking for the susceptibility of pair excitations. And what I find is that the free gas of electrons has a logarithmic behavior. And then, of course, there will be an arbitrarily small coupling constant sufficient in order to get me the superconductivity. This is what we know to happen in non interacting or weakly interacting systems. And it carries over not just to weakly interacting systems, it also carries over to Fermi liquids. When the quantum numbers continue to be those of uh, the free electron system, regardless how strongly the system, these systems actually are interacting, but their quantum numbers stay intact. So when I'm taking one of those uh, carriers here uh, and another one, there might be a cloud around them that is made by many, many excitations that are rather, rather complicated, but still the, the analysis uh, that we are seeing here can be carried over. Um, what we, however, want to do is what happens when these systems are as ill-defined as this uh, illustration just suggests. So for example, we have a self-energy that is characterized by a branch cut. So here we have seen exponents and, um, and uh, uh, Alex calls them delta and I will call them gamma. Uh, and this is a pure homage to Andrei Chubukov and his uh, collaborators who uh, just use a different letter. And I think one is just four times the other minus one or something like this. So. Uh, they can be translated into one another very, very easily. So if this exponent gamma here is between zero and one, which is the case I wish to study, uh, this has a branch cut singularity, and I can now do be naive, and I do the exact same calculation that we've just seen. Um, so I'm summing up the same diagrams. Um, I have less justification to do so. Actually, I have no justification to do so, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, and if I do so, uh, then I will find that the pair susceptibility, because of this much less sharply defined fermion is less sharply pronounced, I don't get a Cooper instability anymore. If this was true, 
and uh, I could continue this in, as this line of reasoning as we just as we've as we're doing here, then I would always need a critical strength of the pairing interaction in order to get a superconducting state. So this is just like the stoner instability for ferromagnetism. Uh, there's nothing illegal about the stoner instability in the narrow sense or in well, and we, it seems to be some, some, some physical justification for it, but it's not a controlled calculation uh, as such. And also, it wouldn't really naturally explain why the superconductivity is most pronounced where you have this quantum criticality at the critical point. It should be, that's where it's absent, because that's where the quasi-particles are least defined. Uh, if this logic was true, of course it's not, I'm just trying to lead on to it. Um, and, uh, and this is why, uh, why we, this is at least something worthwhile discussing. So there's actually a paper from, from Bardeen who discusses why is sodium not superconducting? Because sodium should be superconducting, it's actually not because there's some poorly screened Coulomb interaction in the game, apparently. It should be probably superconducting eventually, but not at these temperatures that are being controlled. And there's no paper from Bardeen, why isn't sodium not ferromagnetic? Why? Because we have a stoner instability fulfilled and nobody's surprised that we don't. Right? So then, if this reasoning, uh, quantum critical superconductivity should be the exception rather than the rule. So. There are answers to this problem, and uh, they, these answers have been discussed, um, and uh, there is a great deal of research going on. And what I want to do is I want to discuss two possible answers to you that appear to us completely different. And then at the end, I want to show you that they're actually identical. Uh, but let's look at them, first of all, as being completely different. One is a theory that, um, I think the first uh, version of the theory goes back here to Damson, who is in the room, who looked at uh, uh, soft gluon mediated color superconductivity. And there's an, I think, independent uh, understanding of the same physics by Abanov, Chubukov, and Finkelstein on spin fluctuation induced superconductivity uh, due to antiferromagnetic or spin density wave systems, and a number of follow up works, of course. So, what you do here is you have essentially a Yukawa type coupling, you have some boson, I call it phi, and I have fermion bilinear psi dagger psi. Um, there is some coupling constant, there are some quantum numbers involved, they couple. So then you make, you work hard, you look at some critical point, and if you try to make certain more or less unjustified approximations, sometimes more, sometimes less approximate, you find such a branch cut at isolated quantum critical points. Uh, there's a lot of discussion um, of whether this is justified in each individual case and whether this is controlled and so forth, but um, let's be pragmatic about it for the time being. So then you get what we just get, but the assumption of the, of the, of the analysis that we've just seen here was that we continued to use an instantaneous pairing interaction. So we still had a coupling constant that was just a number. Uh, but what you should be doing, of course, is um, when you're in such a critical system to appreciate the fact that the interactions themselves are equally singular and power law behaved and strange then because we are in such a critical state. And if you do so, you find in a number of cases that the same exponent that just characterized the branch cut singularity of the fermions also determines the singularity of the pairing interaction. And as this is the same exponent, there's a chance of balancing uh, the pain that you've just uh, went through by having, say, well, ill-defined quasi-particles by having them interact more strongly. And it's this balance uh, that will give us rise to something that you may call a generalized Cooper instability uh, taking place in a system that is a quantum critical state. In fact, it turns out that it's more powerful if you have a very well-defined dial, such as the coupling of SYK dots that uh, Alex was just referring to. Good. This is one way to think about pairing in critical system. And there's a completely different one, which I, I, have, to very, I have to admit very openly and clearly, I had no idea. I didn't understand a word of all of this. And it's, it's called the holographic superconductivity. 
and essentially is based, and I will have to go into some more detail as we move on, because I assume some of you at least know as little as I did uh, uh, at some point about it. So the idea is that we have a d plus one dimensional quantum field theory and it lives uh, and it can be efficiently described by a d plus two dimensional gravity theory. And then you do what, let's just take this for granted. I have to say more words on this one for sure. But if I take this for granted, then I know what to do in a superconductor. I do a Ginsburg-Landau theory, right? Uh, and I write down my Ginsburg-Landau action in that space. Of course, I have not yet justified why this should be done, but let's assume it should be. So then I have a Ginsburg-Landau theory, and then I look at instabilities. This is something that was uh, put forward by the late Steve Gupta and by Sean Fran Hartnell, uh, Christopher Herzog, and uh, Horowitz uh, now in 2008, and has uh, clearly stimulated a lot how one could and should think about superconductivity in critical systems. So. Again, my goal is to show you that actually this theory and that theory uh, are very, very closely related to one another. And what we want to do is to use the SYK model as a tool from which we can build to actually describe critical Fermi surfaces to derive from a theory of this type, the gravity. We will start with a many body Hamiltonian and then step by step get a gravity theory out of it. And then there's no doubt it's obviously there. So then we have an understanding, what is the extra dimension of the problem? Uh, why is there a gravity formulation of that problem and so forth? So what we are trying to do, so the program that we are trying to do is to some extent similar to, uh, even though we should be more humble, but it at least has an analogy to uh, what Lev Petrovich Gorkov did uh, when he, uh, started with CBCS theory and demonstrated to the world that uh, you can derive from it the Ginsburg-Landau theory, right? Um, and there were non-trivial implications of that derivation. The first one was it made more convincing the statement that uh, uh, there's no real problem in the BCS theory as far as gauge invariance is concerned. And also it told us what's the charge of the Ginsburg-Landau theories, namely it's two times E. You can read in the original paper what Ginsburg and Landau said about it. And they said it's probably E. And there's an essay by Ginsburg on the subject who explains why they thought so. Because um, Landau apparently realized that the mass can be different of this object in the kinetic energy term. And masses can be different for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and you look at free electron systems and put them in, in, in say, some more complicated environment. And masses can also then be space dependent in principle. Uh, but to assume that the charge was space dependent was unacceptable to Landau because it meant that it would violate the gauge principle. Um, and therefore, what else do you do? Then it can change, so therefore it's E. Uh, but of course, uh, the argument is not uh, affected if I put an integer or maybe some other topological number up front for the charge there, right? Uh, and uh, therefore 2E or 16E are perfectly well allowed objects. So good. So what we will be, and, what, and also what it clarified is what was the scalar field of the BCS, of the Ginsburg-Landau theory. Namely, it could be written in terms of the anomalous propagator where you create uh, or annihilate uh, a pair of electrons here in the singlet uh, or odd uh, um, spin channel, opposite spin channel, and uh, where we have basically two different positions where we can do this in two different uh, time points. And just to remind ourselves, because it will become important, it is to some extent sensible to look at this object as depending on the center of gravity coordinate, which is the one that appears in fact here in the Ginsburg-Landau theory. This describes inhomogeneous states, a vortex, for example. Uh, then we can also look at the total time difference uh, of the system. This is the one that appears in the Ginsburg-Landau theory if you make it time dependent. And that describes, for example, non-equilibrium behavior. So you radiate your sample electromagnetically and so forth. You do time dependent Ginsburg-Landau as uh, complicated as this may be. Then we have also the dependence between, with regards to the relative coordinates here. That doesn't appear in the Ginsburg-Landau theory. It's actually being projected out when we are going into the channel that is ultimately the superconducting one. 
but this is important information because it tells us what the internal structure of the pair is. Um, is it a D wave or a P wave? Clearly, but also what its internal dynamics is. And here we have to be more careful uh, when we do the holographic version at the critical, or when we look at the critical point, doesn't have to do anything to do with holo holography in the narrow sense, because we need to know something what's the internal structure of the Cooper pair if we are at a critical point. And it will be precisely this aspect that will lead us to the extra dimension of the gravitational description. So the internal dynamics of the Cooper pair. Good. So what we will be therefore doing here is that we will also start from the anomalous Green's functions and then derive a field that lives in one extra dimension that uh, very often is called zeta or z or r or u or whatever, right? So uh, this is uh, our, um, our goal. Then we can also identify similarly the origin of gravity, the physical interpretation of the dimension, and we will demonstrate that this will have uh, some equivalence to critical bosons. Yes, Avi? Why hmm? one dimension? Absolutely correct. So this is a mystery, but of course we will try to resolve it. Um, so, th th so let me let me uh, comment on on what uh, is a very very good question. So, he, what do I have here? If I have the center of gravity and the uh, relative coordinates, uh, then obviously the system in d dimension depends on not only d plus one but twice d plus one coordinates. But I only want to get to d plus two. For d equals zero, that's the same, uh, right? I mean, only time when I get twice time, it's the same uh, than twice time. But when, uh, but in finite dimension, it will not. And we will have to see whether what really works out here and whether what I'm saying is nonsense. But we will have to get to that. It could be, you're right, that in fact, I get to a twi two d plus one dimensional gravity theory. You won't, but you need to do it carefully. Then you would see that this is the case. So, good. Now a few words on the holographic uh, principle. Um, uh, so we are all on the same page and we know what we are talking about. Um, again, this goes back to um, truly pioneering papers written in the late 90s, um, where the uh, partition function, for example, of some uh, quantum field theory was mapped onto um, as, uh, the uh, gravity theory um, and uh, could be uh, at the on if you have some certain well defined large n limit, then the gravity theory becomes classical and can be dealt with. So, one way to visualize is we have our uh, quantum field theory here with space and time, and then we look at it from the side and add the extra dimension. And it is in this extra dimension where we have um, uh, a gravitational interpretation and that so called radial di direction of the problem which uh, in the usual interpretation of this community has somewhere the field theory living on, on some boundary. And then you go uh, and this scale has to do something with the renormalization group scale, which you, uh, you probe the system on different energies. Um, so often when you're at finite temperatures, we are very well familiar that the renormalization group flow stops. And how would a holographer do this? Of course, uh, you put a black hole because then something seems to be changing uh, at that scale. So th that's uh, how you do this here. And um, to me, this looked absolutely gorgeous. And I had no idea what these people were talking about. And it's very interesting um, how the community works. I assume they all understand what they were doing, but I could not understand why is there for no apparent reason, an extra dimension appearing in the problem that is at least not manifest in the original formulation uh, and what this really means. And uh, mostly some of the argumentation that I will be giving and calculation that we are doing were driven by the urgent desire to understand this uh, from say the pedestrian condensed matter perspective. So, and then of course, this is what I already mentioned to you. You write down against Boglando theory if you wish to study superconductivity. There's something uh, quite interesting. If you look at such, uh, which is related to this curved space story, which usually takes place in a so called anti tessitor space. I have a picture of one uh, in a second. Um, and uh, so, where you have the mass in Ginsburg Lander theory, usually at the mean field level. When this object changes sign, that's when we are at the transition. In this case, the curved space helps you a little bit, and you need to be more negative than a certain bound. 
that was calculated long ago in the literature of uh, enter the citrus space. Cool, goes in the name of Brighton low non treatment. Good. So here, finally, we can see uh, the Euclidean version of uh, enter the zitter space two, which is nothing else but a hyperboloid. I'm only drawing you half of the space, the other half uh, is, is not there. It's just a good old fashioned hyperboloid solution of this equation. And this will be ADS2 if my time is Euclidean, uh, which we do because we want to have uh, a statistic mechanics description. And uh, there's a very useful parameterization um, of, these, uh, of this equation here in terms of two variables, which of course uh, is sufficient. One is already called tau because it will be our imaginary time. And the other one is zeta because it will be zeta. Uh, so the holographic version. And in this space, uh, geodesics are these half circles um, and the metric uh, is given here. So basically the fact that this is curved, you can see by this coefficient here, which was flat, it would just be d tau squared and d zeta squared. And in those coordinates, you can also cover uh, the, the uh, H2, but uh, that doesn't look particularly beautiful because of course, with this choice of var variables, we picked one coordinate to be different than naturally than the others. It's not something that should make us nervous. This is uh, a nice way to look at this problem. Um, so therefore we have this additional dimension here that uh, is uh, describing ADS2. So this, now we know everything we need to know uh, about gravity because that's uh, this, this is symmetric. So if I write this and I generalize this to a, to a system that is uh, this in D dimension, so therefore it goes to D plus two dimension problem then, the metric would be the one of ADS D plus two, again, in imaginary time, and this is how it would look like. In real time, there's just a minus sign here. Um, and uh, these are just for us to realize that these equations are perfectly straightforward for those who have never worked with them. Um, uh, and so if you, for example, write down now um, uh, this uh, scalar field in such a space, uh, then we can calculate the determinant of the metric. We can Multi, uh, evaluate this, uh, the derivatives here, and then you get an expression. Well, it doesn't look that bad. There's some power law coefficients up front here, and then there's derivatives in the radial direction are ready to fully transform in frequency in momentum. That's how it looks like. Um, and um, there's something interesting also, I can look at the saddle point uh, of this equation, and that's the equation I would have to solve here. Uh, it's a differential equation that is not too hard to solve. Um, and we will recover it later when we look at Eliasberg equations. And I just wanted to prepare to you because this is uh, uh, what, what the Klein-Gordon equation basically would be in this enter the zitter space. If I assume that I can fully transform in momentum and frequency space and only have this additional dimension to really worry about. Okay, so this is an equation that we should not have any fear um, uh, you can see already if you go to uh, Q and omega equals zero, so we only have um, this part here. Uh, so this is so inhomogeneous in this additional dimension. We can see that one immediately can diagonalize this in a few steps. And the transformation is a so-called Malin transformation. So basically a Fourier transformation in logarithmic variables. Um, if you do so, you can uh, write this action as just coupled harmonic oscillators. And here you see that the mass has to be more negative than this value. This is our right and loner Friedman bound in order for the system to become unstable, right? Um, otherwise, this, in these logarithmic variables, this is how this uh, would look like in this. Um, so nothing all that complicated. We have now accumulated sufficient knowledge um, to kind of do, do manipulations uh, in, this, in this description. Yes? No, it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Yeah. Basically, is the logarithm. So if the scale goes from zero to infinity, the logarithm goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. That's why you have to do it like this. Yeah. This is all well defined on say, above. This is only well defined above TC. Um, uh, everything becomes more complicated when you're going below TC. This is, these are these Gaussian fluctuations of a non superconductor. That's what I'm trying to do here, which is much easier than going into superconducting state. Yes, absolutely correct. So 
there's more than ADSB plus two. We need all of this because we need to make concrete calculations. We will find results that require us to go a little bit beyond this because there's something special, of course, not too surprisingly, if I look at this uh, specific metric here at T equals zero, there's no black hole here. We are not at T at finite temperatures. And if I rescale my time and my length scale by the same scale factor, and I do this with this funny new dimension, since I don't know what it is, I shouldn't lose much sweat over it, what I need to do. But at least if I rescale time and space in the exact same way, then um, this uh, line element here is invariant. Um, but what does that mean? For the condensed matter context, that's not precisely what we often see. In the condensed matter context, what we rather see is uh, that you need to rescale length scales differently from time scales. Um, and uh, there's some so-called dynamical scaling exponent Z uh, that tells us how length scales and time scales are scaled differently. So this would not be something naturally encompassed by uh, this antitositor space, of course. And it will only be important once we even have space. For the time being, when we're talking about AD, uh, uh, SYK, we don't have much to say about space, but we will get to this. So then uh, it would be nice to generalize this. And of course, the community has worked on it. And uh, here, for example, is something that goes under the name of Lifshitz spacetime, for the obvious reason, because of anisotropies. Uh, for those who don't know this, when you have a usual 5-4 theory and you have a gradient squared as usual in one direction, but for whatever reason, the coefficient of the gradient square in other direction is zero, then you take the next gradient, which is fourth power and the system becomes anisotropic. Here we have an anisotropy, not between different spatial directions, but between time and these spatial directions. But this is where the name comes from. And then you have essentially here a, a metric that uh, just is anisotropic with regards to say the space and the temporal and also radial direction here. Uh, so this goes under the name of the Lifshitz space time. And there is in fact a very nice work that I at least uh, managed to understand to some extent uh, by uh, Sean Hartnell and collaborator where they could generalize something from a general relativity perspective. So what they did is they said, well, let me just add to my matter fields the fluid that goes propagates to my system and uh, take an ideal fluid description where the equation of state that relates density and pressure then was just taken from a Thomas Fermi approach something straightforward and simple and if you then solve this problem you actually get uh, whatever z value you want to have uh, depending on a parameter that determines the equation of state of the problem this is not a particularly constructive statement maybe for us, uh, but it tells us at least that um, if there's a back reaction of C critical fluid on the gravity, there can be more than just enter the zitter spaces. Um, um, we need to still understand why we're even talking about all this stuff, uh, but I'm a, it's a moment here to accumulate some knowledge so we can discuss this um, on a more sophisticated basis. So, and we will, have, and this of course has been called electron stars, which is a beautiful name. Uh, and uh, because it's precisely this, you have some matter that affects the gravity, uh, doesn't necessarily form a black hole and, and therefore um, exists there and changes uh, a geometry. And of course, also because it was motivated by a work from Oppenheimer um, uh, uh, on um, neutron stars, very much the same logic and so forth, yes. Oh, this is, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing. Oh, there's, a, there's also an equation of state for the current and the conductivity of the system uh, that would then make it an, a, a charged object. It has something to do with this. I just didn't write it down. There's another equation of state that relates the current. And I think you can also get this without this, um, uh, but the calculation was done, you know, maybe more. Uh, no, the calculation was done for a charged system that had a finite conductivity. Beta star is a, is a coefficient in the equation of state of the, uh, of the Thomas Fermi description. It's just a, a dimensionless parameter that characterizes the, the, uh, the equation of state of the system. All I want to tell you is um, 
you don't need to write, they're very, very more complicated theories to get to these Lifshitz uh, gravity theories. Um, but this is at least something where can follow the philosophy of the, of the um, or the physical motivation of it. Why do I do this? Because we will see that we get such geometries for specific critical system. In fact, an Ising ferromagnetic quantum critical point in two dimension will behave just like this. We will see. Good. So now we, however, go back to our SYK model. Now we have cleared the, the, the air and discussed some of the mathematics that we need to move forward. And now can go back to look at Hamiltonians and so forth that we uh, cherish uh, usually a bit more. And I'm starting the discussion uh, by looking at zero space dimension, the problem that we've just seen in Alex Kamenev's talk, the SYK model. So here's it again. Um, as I wish to study superconductivity, I would be foolish in starting uh, this description in terms of Majorana formulas because we've just seen. Um, I mean, it is already superconducting if you want so, uh, because it has not. I mean, the, the particle number conservation is not uh, is manifestly broken, so therefore it's not a sensible question to ask. Um, so therefore we will have charged or ordinary complex fermion, whatever you want to call them, with this all to all interaction that goes to N. I've just chosen, that says one over N stands up front here, so I have an easier correlator. Uh, and uh, how to do with this, deal with this problem, we've also seen instead of thinking in terms of the original fermions of the problem, you think in terms of bilocal fields, propagators and self-energies are the fluctuating objects. Uh, and uh, we have seen the tricks to get there uh, to this result in the previous talk. And uh, something like this can be done here as well at the large n, n infinity more precisely limit. This is the branch cut singularity that you might get. You can write down an analytic expression, at least correct at lowest frequencies. And then of course, there's some at finite and some low scale where we see that this actually turns around. Uh, we've just learned this in the previous talk. I will mostly discuss um, this as my reference frame and look at small superconducting fluctuations relative to this state. Um, and we will look at what, how these superconducting fluctuations behave. And as we've also seen in the previous talk, um, you can uh, do this reparameterization of time. Um, and if you do so, um, you can do the reparameterization of time if you ignore high energy behavior and physics that's related on the cutoff, because this is the derivative that was der neglected in Alex's previous talk. And then uh, you have actually an infinity of solution if you include, however, the derivative, the temporal derivative, of course, you need to pay a price for such a reparameterization. And this is the price expressed in terms of uh, the Schwarzschild derivative because it keeps the leftover uh, Möbius transformation invariant that we've also seen. So this is, <clears throat> as we also heard, um, the gravitational theory of, say, a meta-free uh, gravitational space in two dimensions, the so-called jacques teitelbaum uh, uh, geometry. Good. This is the such a Yekitaev model. And again, um, our personal motivation was we want to see what happens to this beast as it becomes superconducting, right? Just out of fun, uh, no further justification for it. And to do so, the need to actually have, <clears throat> or it's at least very, very convenient to have a model that gives you at the large n mean field level superconducting solutions mean field superconducting solutions at n infinity. Uh, and we therefore wrote down a slightly different model that goes now under the name of Yukawa SYK model here in this paper with Ilya Estelis a couple of years ago now, where we have, again, our fermions is just a chemical potential, no kinetic energy. We now have bosons, <clears throat> call them phonons. Um, they have a conjugate momentum and they have a finite frequency. They are gapped. These phonons are gapped as some optical frequency everywhere the same. And then we couple them with a random all to all coupling constant uh, C, psi i, psi, and phi. So this is our model. G are random couplings. I have to say more about how we choose uh, the distribution functions. Um, this has, there's a essentially independent uh, work by Yushan Wang 
um, he chooses slightly different versions, so therefore he doesn't get superconductivity at the mean field level, but otherwise the normal state is very much the same. It's actually an interesting uh, experience I had. We were sharing an office in Stanford when we did this work. I didn't know yet that he was my office mate. He had done his calculations on the blackboard, uh, and these were my equations, in quote unquote, but with a different handwriting, different written by somebody else. So I was felt uh, it was very, very weird experience. Uh, to see this, um, it was really done independently and so forth. And there are generalizations to finite dimensions that we will exploit uh, later on. So how do we do the distribution functions? Um, first of all, we need to realize um, that uh, this Hamiltonian, of course, has to be omission. So therefore, G, J, G, I, J must be G, J, I star. Uh, then uh, it can still, however, be complex as a real and imaginary part. And uh, we take different distribution functions for the real and for the imaginary part, which we parameterize by a value alpha. Um, I can write down the proper distribution function for different indices, the one that uh, Damson wanted for the J's, uh, but maybe that's just too destructive. Uh, but important is that if, for example, this value alpha here is zero, then there is no imaginary part. So this is a purely real quantity then. So therefore, we are, we are drawing for given k, the gij's from Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. On the other hand, if the distribution of the real and the imaginary part are the same, so alpha would then be one, there's a half here and a half here, then we're drawing this from a Gaussian unitary ensemble. Now we will see that in the unitary ensemble, we will not find superconductivity for the Orthogonal ensemble, however, we do find superconductivity. Physically, this means I have a random realization uh, that breaks time reversal symmetry in one case and doesn't in the other. And we know that time reversal symmetry can be poison for uh, Cooper pair. Uh, and uh, hence this result. And we introduce this parameter alpha here to basically to be able to interpolate between these two limits. Uh, which just is just convenient. Uh, then you can see how things change. You can call alpha the pair breaking parameter. Yes. There's no force on you in terms of the there is none. Yeah. It's just electrons interacting with bosons. Yeah. So um, the procedure is now very much the same. We want to calculate the partition sum. We usually have this for a given realization. There is some replica story, and we've heard uh, lots of discussions on the replica aspects uh, already in Alex's talk. Um, so if I then look at this, uh, uh, this uh, disorder problem here, and uh, uh, upon replication, there's a new replica indices, I just basically square this up here. But this is really only the result that I get for the Gaussian unitary ensemble. So where real and imaginary parts of this coupling constant are the same, so I get basically the operator here twice, and I've just rearranged them already that next to each other is the same index i, i, j, j, and l, l that goes to n or m if you want to take a different number of boson flavors. And now, of course, um, the introduction of these bilocal fields here, as we've seen them here for bosons and fermions can be done. And you can write down the interaction energy as a trace in the appropriate way. So, this would be the same steps that we've just seen for the fermionic, four fermion interacting uh, um, SYK model, now done for the problem that we wish to study here. And so we get uh, this term here, we enforce these uh, identities with Lagrange multiplier fields that gets in same letters and eventually it's a saddle point, the same meaning as self energies. Fermions can then be integrated out and we get an effective action only in terms of these bilocal fields that are so convenient to us. But before we do this, we need to see what happens when we have the generic ensemble, not alpha equals one that we just looked, which was the one for the Gaussian unitary ensemble. If we do this, all what changes is index orientation. So we don't even want to look at this, but we have to for a second, because now we see that the same indices I and I that are so important at large n, both come with creation operators or with annihilation operators in pairs. So if you want to now deal with this problem and do the, just the same recipe for this problem, again, we need to have a Gorkov anomalous Green's function as a fluctuating field. 
Uh, and uh, the same analogy then introducing uh, conjugated fields and so forth that enforce them would then give us an effective interaction that looks like this. Here's always our pair breaking parameter. Now we have the Gorkov fields here, and this are the usual Green's functions that we have. That's all what changes, but there's hope that we get solutions that will give us superconductivity. That's the technical steps to get there. Yes. Uh, the pairing with I. Well, as it, I can always do them, but then the contribution is small in one over n. Yeah, I want to have, I want to tailor make my theory. This is all engineering here, right? We're not solving, we're not having nature in front of us and writing down nature's Hamiltonian and then solve nature's Hamiltonian. No, no, we are cheating. We are writing down the Hamiltonian we can solve, uh, but we are writing the Hamiltonian that gives us the physics we wish to see. So um, let's just be completely honest about this. Yes. yes. Uh, in the case when alpha is between zero and one. Yes. Can the strength of symmetry remain while the center of the symmetry? Can the which central symmetry? Central symmetry. Uh, probably central symmetry i just don't know what is meant by the time reversal symmetry is broken for realizations and of course restored on the average but i don't oh this is the wrong way back i don't know which is back no oh the, the bottom yes central symmetry uh, maybe the person could just clarify what's meant by this i'm sure uh so uh, good. How am I doing on time? Uh, we have 40 minutes left. Excellent. So, yeah. and, oh. and again, how, how did you went from having two primaries on the ocean to four primaries on the ocean? Uh -huh. So, it's actually here. Oh, no. If I point there, this thing doesn't go there, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, if you so this is this is uh, the actual interaction with the randomness now g i j k i j l is um it's a gaussian distributed field so the way you think about it is is this here to clean the blackboard You have I, J, K, and some operator, I, J, K, and you average over this one. You need to do this, of course, with replications. So there's some replica index A, and then you have G squared O, I, J, K, dagger A, O, I, J, K. So you double. It's just a Gaussian integral because you have here some You just do the integral, the Gaussian integral over G. Good. So now integrating out fermions, I get a field theory in terms of these bilocal fields here written, all convolutions are somewhere hidden. Um, I have a number structure now, of course, because I have all these anomalous propagators. And of course, when we look at this, this looks like a Lord Luttinger Ward functional. Um, but of course it's not, it's an actual action. And that's why, it, why it's so much fun to look into this because we can look at the actual fluctuations of these bilocal fields. Good, with this, we want to work. The first step is of course, we take the saddle points because I'm not doing these sophisticated things that Alex was referring to yet, or at least fluctuations. We first need to see what the saddle point looks like clearly, right, uh, of this problem. N is the number of fermions. M is the number of bosons. All what matters is that they're both large and their ratio can then be arbitrary. So if I do this, I get equations that are, we are very well familiar with. So recall what Alex got when he did the saddle point was something that looked awfully like self-consistent second order perturbation theory. In fact, we could have ignored all this stuff 
and done just self-consistent second order perturbation theory, of course, nobody has given us permission to do so in the system where the unperturbed system was uh, zero. And the perturbation is infinitely larger than the perturbation than the bare part. Here, we, uh, the, the, the entire large n random and so forth coupling constant justifies to do something that we could have done otherwise. What we get here are basically Lerschbeck equations. So we get, I mean, the, the derivatives with respect to the, um, respect to the self energies always give you the Dyson equation for bosons and fermions. And the other ones now give me the self energies, and this is just one loop, self consistent one loop for the bosonic, so phononic, and fermionic normal and anomalous range function, where this is F and this is G because the arrows and the diagrams and so forth. So all what we have done is we have given permission to solve Eliashberg's equations and don't need to ask anymore. And everybody who comes and tells, oh, what about Mikdal's theory? We say, go away, I have done a large N calculation, but that's all really what we have accomplished here so far on the saddle point, right? So we can then solve this problem and we get for the Green's function and for, the, for both the uh, boson, the, uh, the fermion and the bosonic Green's function, we get power law solutions. This is non-trivial result because our boson started out to be gapped. It is this interaction of the system that ultimately, and no matter what you do, drives the system to a critical ground state. The renormalized boson mass always gets renormalized at t equals zero to zero, and it goes with the same power law basically that also governs the bosonic dynamics of the system. So we get a critical state. Um, this is also governed by the exact same exponent here, gamma, that is between zero and one. If I choose m equals n, I get whatever, 0.68. So important is, that you get a critical state that you can tune. There's actually a dimensionless constant in the problem, which is, well, our interaction and a certain power of the, um, of the bare phonon frequency. This is dimensionless, uh, and you didn't have a dimensionless coupling constant in the SYK model because there was only one energy scale, and at t equals zero, it doesn't matter. Here we have a dimensionless parameter, and it depends a little bit, and t equals zero result doesn't depend on it, but what happens at finer temperatures is affected by it, but at lowest temperatures, we get this uh, power law result. I'm prepared to do the analytical, the calculation to get to this result on the blackboard, but um, I don't know whether anybody cares to see the solution. Uh, you need to uh, yell if you want. So what you see is um, that you get these branch cut singularities here for the both fermionic and for the bosonic solution, and at finite temperature, it gets softened. Good. I can also look at here at higher temperatures and the solution at large dimension as coupling constant actually changes. The boson gets extremely soft and the fermion looks like it just sees impurities. Um, so there's a wide intermediate regime here where the physics is somewhat different. We have extremely incoherent fermions. This is not even a branch cut anymore. It's just a blob. Um, and the bosons are perfectly sharp, but extremely soft. That's just a thermally excited state. All the bosons are thermally excited, essentially, um, and therefore act as impurities for the electrons, uh, and you get just a different state. You didn't have that state in this sense in the SYK model. At lowest temperatures, however, these states are the same. Yes, please. Yes. There's a reparameterization invariance, yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it is, if you go to the fixed point uh, and then try to, uh, uh, you, you find, you, you have an equation at, for, uh, at, the, at t equals zero, you have to be, um, uh, and for those equations, I can find a reparameterization invariance. It's a bit more subtle at finer temperatures because the bosons get massive. Yeah, it, um, yeah. Yeah. is enslaved by the fermions by Landau damping. Yeah, so the bare initial dynamics of the boson is here completely irrelevant. All what matters is which dynamics is imposed onto the phonons by Landau damping, if you want so, or by the self energy that is due to the fermionic system. Yeah, so that's why they say in this, now I need to think, sorry. 
That's why this, this is the exact same exponent here in these two, right? Yeah. So again, you need to decide, do you want me to do the calculation? Nobody cares. It's good enough, good. So um, you can also now the next, this was all for the Gaussian unitary ensemble that wasn't superconducting. Now I make the system superconducting and I find a superconducting transition temperature. It's actually very simple. You find a T squared with the dimensional coupling constant here at small coupling as opposed to exponentially small. So in that sense, TC is much higher than the one you would have gotten for a Fermi liquid. We get to this once we couple dots. Yes. TC, the transition temperature goes like this coupling constant to G squared. It's parabolic here. And then it levels off because um, on the one hand, you get um, these very, very soft bosons that is good, but your fermions are also pretty incoherent. Uh, and there's a balance and that you actually get a TC that goes to a finite value. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, it doesn't depend on the exponent. It's always g squared. So you can also see there's a Bogolubov quasi particle. These are numerical solutions here. This is very flat um, in the normal state. And we are here at strong coupling. We're in this regime somewhere. Uh, and then we get a very small coherent weight uh, of the Bogolubov quasi particle that actually vanishes asymptotically. Why? Because it's such a broad state. Um, there's not much spectral weight to be gained within the scale of the uh, of the gap, if you want. So, and that scales this uh, inverse power of this dimension is coupling constant. So, what is to be said here is here actually TC sets in at the exact same scale where you would have gotten the system quantum critical. Uh, here you are in the middle of this funny state where you get uh, superconductivity. It therefore makes sense to dial our pair breaking parameter because if I now go into a different direction here and add this pair breaking, then I can tune my transition temperature arbitrarily small. There's an advantage here with this essential singularity type of behavior. And uh, this will be no surprise, at least to those who have thought about how you can break conformal symmetry, such as Damson. This is always how you would have to do this. Uh, these essential singularities appear quite often. It is one universal value of alpha C or one generic value of alpha C independent on the details of the problem. And this is also how you would lose superconductivity in these uh, ADS type models. Incidentally, uh, if you're going to this brighton loan of Friedman bound. So this funny exponential essential singularity type of behavior. So this is a superconducting state that we have now understood on the mean field level. Now we want to go back to understand its say holographic relevance of the state. And for this, we recall one more time, what we are doing is we really actually have to integrate over all these fields. And in particular, we have to integrate over those pairing fields here. And uh, those were the ones I recall that are relevant for these anomalous green functions. So what I will do is now we will look at Gaussian fluctuations on top of this critical mean field state, just to get a sense how would they look like? Just superconducting Gaussian fluctuations, the simplest calculation I could do to describe some aspect of superconductivity just above TC. And since we can bring TC to zero, I can also be just near this critical point where, TC, where superconductivity might disappear. Um, and in doing so, uh, it is useful, again, as I discussed earlier, to go from the two time variables to the center of gravity, time and Fourier transform it to what I call omega, and the relative time and Fourier transform it to what I call epsilon. It's just two different ways of characterizing the same subject. If I do so and I expand my Gaussian theory, I get the result here. This second part is known to us. This is our effective interaction that we've just seen earlier already. All I do is since I'm expanding on the normal state, I can insert here my solution from the normal state that we've just seen, which is a power law. And then I have some trace log to deal with, but I'm only doing this up to second order. So there are just something that has some diagrammatic interpretation and is essentially 
some particle-particle uh, -particle propagator. We trace log with for phi and have integrated out phi, the anomalous self-energy already. That's why this looks like this. So this has an interpretation again here. This is the power law behavior of the pair of the phonon propagator that was given to us from this critical normal state. And here we have the particle particle propagator of the normal state given by the fermions and characterized by its own exponents. So this is the theory of Gaussian fluctuations. I could stop here and say this is the theory of Gaussian fluctuations, period. But what you can do is you can look at this equation, and for example, let's say stationary saddle point. This is stationary saddle point of the problem. This has to be equal to the linearized gap equation of the problem. And of course, it is equal. If I just call this object here phi and I go to omega equals zero, I get an equation that many, many people have written down. I'm giving you some list, actually not for the SYK model, but for systems in compressible Fermi surfaces uh, with critical states in either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic and some kind of systems where there's a different exponent. We have our exponent here, but you can actually refine the self-energy for the anomalous self-energy on the Fermi surface of a compressible system. And we will get to this more clearly uh, as we move on. You can solve this equation, but here we already see that this gap equation is, uh, this is, this is the, you know, self-energy that weakens the Cooper log and the singular pairing interaction that makes it stronger again, and they both add basically to zero. Uh, that's what I mentioned earlier uh, in this discussion when we said, how can you avoid the Cooper, uh, the, the death of the Cooper instability in singular systems? Good, so this is what we get from this uh, SYK model as well. And uh, we can now do a, a very, very nice analogy. And um, uh, I have learned the trick from this paper here by Demson because he sits in the first row, I need to say this, particular because he sits in the first row. So then you have this gap equation here and you assume that this uh, gamma is small. If it's small, then this is a weakly varying function and you can basically split the integral depending on whether epsilon prime is small or larger than epsilon and uh, have two contributions and then easily find a differential equation for the problem. And this is the differential equation that's equivalent in this limit to this integral equation. And clearly everybody likes differential equations more than integral equations because there's a command to desolve. Uh, and then we know what to do. But what you can also do is that you take this second order differential equation and introduce a new variable of a little bit of experimentation where zeta is just the inverse of the relative frequencies Matsubara energy. And if you do so, then you find this equation, which happens to be an equation I showed you earlier, namely the decline gordon equation in enter the zeta space ADS2, where the mass of this problem is given by the exponents and the coupling constant and so forth. And the bright lower Friedman bound is actually one quarter. So depending on these two terms here, we can see there's a critical coupling constant uh, where the system is in or outside the superconducting state. What we see from this analysis is that mathematically, this is not an accident, that there's an extra dimension and that the physics of this extra dimension indeed is the internal dynamics of the Cooper pair that we need to pay attention to once the system is quantum critical. And that's why it's not enough to write down a order parameter theory of a d plus one dimensional problem in d plus one dimensional theories, but better in d plus two dimension because we need to keep track of this additional internal dynamics of an order parameter theory. So if we then do something and go, even this was for a static solution, we allow for time dependencies, there should be a tau here. Then <clears throat> you can even give this a geometric interpretation. At first glance, there are a bunch of minus signs. They don't work out the way we want it to uh, for the enter the sitter space. Um, and one has to do a little bit of a detour that costs us several months. In the end, there's not deep physics in it, I believe. What you need to do is uh, that you need to not look at this original variables, but you need to average over geodesics of this problem, which goes under the name of a Radon transformation. I don't want to waste too much time on this because I could increasingly believe it's not important. But what you do then is you take your scalar field and average over well-defined geodesics, something you can learn from the holographic community. And in this variable, you do find indeed a mapping between our Gorkov propagator and the scalar field. 
just uh, where the meaning of the additional dimension is essentially, again, as I said earlier, that the inverse frequency gives you this uh, additional uh, dimension. And you get then indeed the metric of an ADS2 problem in the sum. So this superconductor has an action that looks like this. It's precisely the action we want with this mapping. This is hidden, nothing else but our anomalous Green's function of the Gorkov problem, but keeping track of the fact that you have to pay attention to internal dynamics of the Cooper pair. And then we live in two dimensions and not in one dimension where we had before just time. That's really all there is. And we can interpret the individual terms, but I need to first know how much time I have because I want to get some more. 20 minutes, very good. I have enough time then. So we can interp interpret all these different terms that occur here in this action because we have the, you know, uh, the new dimension has a gradient and it actually arises, it's a non-local term, it's, um, and it arises from this power law interaction. And it's actually the leading term of a gradient expansion of this power law interacting problem. Um, we can find out that this temporal derivative here comes from the frequency dependent of this uh, propagator here. And both terms contribute to the mass. Uh, there's a, a, tr a repulsive contribution from this term. This is our earlier result. non fermi liquids don't like superconductivity. And therefore, if there was only non fermi liquid physics and no attractive interaction that's singular, it would always get us a positive mass and the system never would want to superconduct. And then there's a negative contribution to the mass coming also from the attractive interaction, which is actually by itself always more negative than the brighton loan of Friedman bond. Uh, so this would always love to be in superconducting. It's just being prevented from doing so by the fact that these, by, this is a non firm liquid state. So, so there is a, this critical coupling constant that we saw where TC vanishes is there because the system is not a Fermi liquid. Um, and uh, uh, we get, uh, I think now a clear understanding in one very concrete, maybe oversimplified example for why we can see gravitational physics appearing in a, a critical state. Uh, good, this I said already. Of course, you can take the equation, the saddle point of this equation again, and it's again equivalent to the Elyashbek equations. Why? Because it's the same theory. So it's instability better be the same. It's not just somehow similar. It gives you the precise same condition for the onset of superconductivity, number-wise, coefficient-wise, and so forth. It's really a mapping, a constructive mapping. We know all the parameters of the theory, just like you know the parameters of a Ginsburg-Landau theory if you start from a BCS theory and follow Gorkov's recipe. So we can do source fields. I think I don't want to get into this and look at susceptibilities. Uh, you can go to finite temperatures. That's actually cute. You can do that finer temperatures. The mapping gets more elaborate, but actually step by step straightforward because they're mappings of the finite temperature um, metric that has a black hole at a certain horizon energy. There's a mapping you can do to map this onto the zero temperature problem. And you can do the same with the, uh, with the reparameterization invariance on the side of the of the SYK model, you can link the map we've just found, and then you find indeed that the problem can be written as a scalar field in a metric that has a black hole. Well, what the black hole does is stop scaling. So nothing to get overly nervous about. Uh, just RG stops at the temperature scale, and here we see it stops at two pi times T or whatever that means, right? So that's very beautiful. We can also, this is a D here, there's also actually a gauge field involved. Uh, but this is gauge field is not an external gauge field of the problem. What it really is, it is an electrical field that is there when the system deviates in its particle density from particle hole symmetry. So if you have an original problem, the SYK model with a chemical potential that's not at zero, but you move it a little bit away from zero, you, get, you break particle hole symmetry. And if you do so, the holographic version of the superconducting theory looks like it has an electrical field uh, that uh, simulates this broken particle hole symmetry. So if you care about broken particle hole symmetry, you want to look at, say, the thermal power 
uh, of that state or something, then you will have to include in your description uh, this uh, actual, uh, this gauge field in the problem. It's in some gauge, you can write like this. So therefore everything can be done. Uh, it's not just an accident at t equals zero, but it seems to be something much more natural that you can write this as a covariant finite temperature theory in this gravitational space. Now we want to go, it's the last one, it's the question that Dem Song asked earlier, Fermi surfaces. So we want to, uh, I skipped this because this is maybe more interesting. This was a discussion that I just skipped of coupled dots that you can look at the superconductivity there. Yes. Is it just, uh, only at the level of uh, It's in duality on the level of the action itself. So now we look at, again, critical points, but we want to look at finite dimension. Then the specific case I wish to study is an Ising ferromagnet in two dimensions. Um, uh, there are other generalizations of the SYK logic to finite dimensions and I'm giving some references here. And the idea is the following. So we have some momentum state uh, that's periodic. Um, uh, there's momentum state, there's spin, and I have my boson just before. And then there's a coupling here because I have an Ising ferromagnet, I couple my five field now to a Pauli matrix sigma Z. Fine. I don't want charge because there's so much going on with acoustic phonons and solids when charge fields condense that I rather think about spin, but that's really the only reason here. Otherwise I could do the same. And then I have a random, random coupling constant. But the important thing is this random coupling constant is the same for all lattice sites of my lattice. So basically, so it doesn't break translation invariance. It's not you know, random here and random differently here and uncorrelated, it's infinitely correlated. So the way you, I think about this is we have a model with a given coupling constant G and we just average over the model. We have uh, all kinds of different typical coupling constant values. It is a procedure to give us controlled calculations. Uh, and as many of those, uh, you may question it's, it's say physical um, sanity, uh, but it, as such, it is well-defined. So we have um, here now a coupling constant that's random and it's random everywhere in the same fashion. I think the idea goes back here to this work by Debanjan and Eris and, and, and Sentel and so forth. Um, and, and then you average uh, over these say, infinitely correlated systems in space infinitely and in time. If you do so, your bilocal fields now become bilocal in coordinate and in, in time, and you do go through the exact same recipe. We also need to introduce our anomalous propagator if we have the right uh, correlation functions and so forth, if we have the correlation functions of the random couplings and we get the effective by local fields action. And since I'm written this in some abstract form, it looks the same. There are now only traces in coordinate space or momentum space in addition to time, nothing else otherwise. We go to the saddle point equations and at the saddle point equations, we reproduce the good old fashioned Eliasberg equations. In other words, this is yet again, just a way to justify Eliasberg equations if you wish so, just like we did this before. Um, and we can solve them and they have been solved in the past, of course. Um, so we have a boson propagator um, that at this critical point uh, is characterized by Landau damping, omega over Q. And we have a fermionic propagator who for this specific problem has an anomalous dimension two thirds. We discussed already anomalous critical exponents, and it's always been irritating to me that this problem has different critical exponents, dynamical critical exponents for the bosons or the fermions, right? If I rescale energies, I need to rescale momenta by a third power here. And if I do it here, because this is the momentum transfers to the Fermi surface, I need to do it by the power three halves. I'm in two dimensions at the moment, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, because that's where you get these nice exponents. Otherwise you have to deal with logs and you get ch chest pain, uh, but otherwise uh, it, it should go along the same. So this is my critical point that I get. This is the analog of my critical solution. Of course, now I'm only getting it at one point of my coupling constant because the system is only critical at one quantum critical point. It has been studied also with numerics and so forth. I think this is understood. Now comes the point that is um, Avi's question from earlier. My anomalous self-energy at a system that has 
uh, is superconducting. And this superconducting state here will be a P wave triplet. Straightforward calculation to do so. The normal self energy really only depends on the angle of the momentum because the typical magnitude is always given just by the Fermi momentum. In that sense, all the dependence on the relative momentum of the field is frozen in by the Fermi surface. It's always stuck at the Fermi momentum and it's only the relative energy that matters, not the relative momentum. And if I do so, I again get a Gaussian theory now. Now, of course, everything depends on momentum. My pairing interaction here is still singular. This exponent gamma was one third for the problem, but I've chosen here to do this uh, for generic gamma just to see what would change if, I, if this were to change. And I looked at a different critical point for which I can always write down just the same type of generalized problem. My particle particle probability can calculate it here as well. And you see it is very asymmetric in momentum and in frequency space, uh, just because we have a Fermi surface that breaks uh, for momenta very much behave for, for finite momentum relative to the Fermi surface very much differently than it does so for energies. And if I then do the same, I can write down a mapping that is now a little bit different than what we had before. But again, I have the relative frequency here. I call this my inverse holographic variable. And I have some power law up front. And in terms of this object, I can write down an action again that has the same looks than what we had before. It is just that now, of course, uh, the momentum dependence and the frequency dependence is very asymmetric in the problem. That's not too surprising because we are looking at a condensed matter problem with a Fermi surface. From the gravitational point of view, of course, it's something one has to accommodate for. And if you do so, you find that this is the metric of this problem. It's not trivial because these power laws all have to come up to the exact same power up front here. It doesn't have to be a, ge a geometric interpretation for my taste. But if you do so, you find this metric and this is nothing else but the Lifshitz quote unquote electron star metrics that we have seen earlier. Um, and the dynamic critical exponent is given by this power law gamma, and it's just one over one minus gamma. So you can go to a couple of limits here. What we have is of course one third, and then the, the, this is one minus one third is apparently two, two thirds or three halves. And so it's the fermionic anomalous dimension or critical anomalous uh, 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 dynamical scaling exponent that matters here for this holographic description, not the bosonic one. Interestingly, I wouldn't know what to expect beforehand. You can go to gamma equals uh, zero, then you recover ADS. You can go to gamma equals one, then you get an exponentially large power uh, dynamical exponent or ac activated scaling. And this goes is basically the, the metric of ADS two plus uh, this is what I said already. This is the fermionic momentum in the problem. And this is also what I was just about to say. We can go to, to gamma to, uh, to the two limits. And either we find ADS or we find a, a space that fractor, factorizes into ADS2 and flat real space. This is also known in the holographic community to arise in the vicinity of a charged black hole near its, uh, its, its event horizon. But there, um, it is really a state that is perfectly local in space and perfectly non-local in time. But our real situation is not like this. Our real situation is this funny Lifshitz geometry. We can then ask, what is the critical instability of a superconductor to make some concrete statement? And we find that, say, this state here is rather robust against pairing. And this is extremely fragile. And we immediately get, uh, uh, basically, that the superconductivity breaks down in this extremely local theories just to make one statement about this. I think I'm ready to conclude here. Um, what we've managed to, 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 to accomplish is to give the wonderful principle that was put forward by a different community a more concrete condensed matter realization, having an interpretation of what these variables mean. So if you wish, so we have accomplished nothing uh, because we could have solved them just without doing this mapping. On the other hand, we all know that just having, for example, a BCS theory may not always be the ideal tool. Sometimes you do want to have a ginsburg landau theory because you want to look at, say, inhomogeneous states uh, and so forth and so on that are just easier to 
analyze with those tools. And for example, non-equilibrium dynamics of a superconductor is one uh, perspective. I can see where this formulation is just much more powerful uh, than uh, doing this you know, brute force in terms of the Green's function and self energies in the diagrams. Um, in addition, we have seen that um, the superconductivity via critical bosons and the holographic superconductivity are really the same thing. At least one can be derived from the other. So we have, a, at least for me, deeper understanding for either one of these two statements. And maybe this will help us because both communities have worked on an arsenal of insights. Maybe they can influence each other and one can learn a little bit from one another. Thank you so much for your attention. My question probably relates to the end. It, it was probably partially answered by the end, and maybe it went to something, but it's actually about the first part of the talk. You, the, there is this issue of self tuned quantum criticality, right? That no matter what, at zero temperature, the both of mass and the SYK can oh, yes. yeah. always go to, to yeah. zero. And, but then I was worried that if we go to a maybe more physical phase diagram, I'm only describing a single line. In this whole phase diagram, and how do I know that this uh, effective action is even unstable to perturbation at all? Right? Maybe it's just a subcritical uh, description, and actually, yeah. the physics is completely different. Mm -hmm. So, you're right. In the SYK model, it's a critical ground state. I didn't know there was a question mark or a voice raising at the end of the thing, so I could say nothing at the moment, but I'm saying something. Uh, so, there was, uh, yes, uh, the, the SYK problem is purely critical. This theory that I looked at the end that really only makes sense at one fine-tuned critical point, which is what we usually do. I think it was always clear to me that this critical phase is a caricature of something else. Um, and um, at least I would not have been able to do these calculations in finite dimension had I not known what to do from the zero-dimensional case. So therefore, at least pedagogically, it was useful, but yeah. But is there a way to then go to extensive fluctuations around the SYK critical state? See, like we could gauge the table to I don't know, forming a Fermi something. Ah. That, that was the question, right? Because who says that the line is actually a saddle point if you want to bet Hamiltonian of condensed? No, no, but we, we know if we add hopping, what happens, right? Um, okay. it, yeah, yeah. So now, uh, for me, really, I, I came from a different perspective. Uh, I, I never wanted to know why this is a critical phase because it's a silly model. So it behaves silly. So what? Um, it mostly taught me how to think about a certain problem, which I find much more interesting, those systems with, for example, a Fermi surface. Okay. I think the back there was also a question for a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, again, this is hard. Uh, so, uh, we mentioned the two power and that component. Yes. How do you get the connection? Oh, I mean, uh, it's a phonon, uh, Frölich, right? It's exact same physics. It's attractive in, because it's in the charge channel and it's a phonon. And that's why we have triplet for the Ising ferromagnetic case, uh, because it would be repulsive in the charge channel. Uh, but uh, so there is nothing really new compared to what we all know already, how these pairing interactions come about uh, in this specific case, uh, because in the end of the day, we just, if you're just looking at the saddle point, we're seeing the Elerschbeck equation. What might be new is the way to look at the fluctuations around those phases. Yeah. Yeah. Very far around oh. oh, yeah, you need to average. So, yes. So, what you do is um, ah, that's actually a tricky one to some extent. So, you really have to expand, and there's actually an index M here. M. This for each angular momentum is there a coupling? Actually, this term at finite Q couples different angular momenta. But if you do a gradient expansion, you can ignore this um, because it's only coupled on the oh, energy. Oh, 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 oh,
anyway, so you should take the, the, the mode that gives you the most attractive channel. Now, uh, the subtlety is, which I didn't reveal to you, is the decision. I mean, actually, they're all infinitely degenerate, except that on a sub-leading level, beyond the leading approximation, there is a term that would, in this case, you uh, just be a, some non-local term that tells me that one is more attractive than the other. On the Gaussian level, I don't need to be losing too much sweat about it. But if I ever go beyond the Gaussian level, I need to worry about how these modes are actually coupling. Yeah. M equals plus minus one. Yeah. M equals zero is not allowed because it's a, tripl it's a triplet. M equals plus minus one. It's a P wave. It's the most it's small, right? splitting is small, yeah, and splitting is on a level that's on this action sub leading. That's funny. I mean, not a, yeah. Mm -hmm. So could you say a bit more commentation on average knowledge of you know, when you're getting ah. uh, you yeah. and then Oh yes, yeah. So my motivation is this one. I write down a theory that's perfectly stable, has an action like this, a plus k squared by k by minus k. Now let me do a transformation where I'm writing phi of k as one plus a k squared eta of k. So I just weight different momenta differently. I insert this in here. Actually, there should be minus one. I insert this here and I expand to small momenta. I see that it looks to me like it's unstable, but um, it isn't. But Gaussian theories by themselves naked have no meaning. You always need to have a source field that tells you how you should properly couple to the system. And therefore, um, uh, I, I think it's just, uh, you need to, that's why you have to do this so-called funny Radon transformation uh, in, the, in the other case. So it looks unstable, but that's, it's not, I think, physically unstable because I can calculate the physical susceptibility. It's perfectly well-defined. It is um, uh, because I'm looking at the system in inefficient variables and you need to find the right variables. Uh, so here, for example, the field eta would have a change in sine of K if I expand it for a certain regime of parameters, but that's just because I've been silly. Uh, and I need to uh, need to fix this. This is my current understanding of it. I thought initially this was much deeper, but I think there's nothing deep about it. Yes. Is that something that you would have done to have integration? Mm -hmm. So. If I ever wanted to study the superconducting state, right, deep in the superconducting state, well, I mean, everything gets gapped. So this, in the gravitational language, is a giant gravitational back reaction. My personal take on this is, well, I rather solve my Eliasberg equations in this case, and I don't lose too much sweat uh, on doing the gravitational theory for that. Um, but maybe I end up being wrong here. Uh, but if I'm near the superconducting transition, then I can do at least a small correction uh, to the gravitational background. And then I would have to solve Einstein's equation. And we know we have a gravitational theory. Alex has written it down. We have now the superconducting theory. And what we really need to do is we need to just uh, do the variation uh, with respect to both variables and couple them simultaneously. And then we will see what the answer is. Uh, this is doable, but it only makes sense, in my view, near the transition temperature. Other deep in the superconducting state, I don't think, personally, this is something you need to be doing. You just solve the equations that we have anyway. Well, um, uh, so again, the, uh, you, you have an interaction, two fermions, a creation and annihilation operator and a boson. And um, uh, 
then we did several steps to solve it. But in the end of the day, um, there are coupled integral equations that are being, con being controlled in certain crazy large n limits where you get a self energy from a Green's function and a Green's function from a self energy. And you need to compute this and um, you should have raised your hand and say, I want to see this, I'm prepared to do this. Now it's too late on the blackboard. I did all of this, remembered all the exponents uh, and I'm happy to do this for you privately. Yeah. Yes. So if I'm deep in the superconducting state, um, I just have a gapped state. I wouldn't expect much fun out of this calculation, but it may well be a relevant calculation for certain applications. But uh, if I'm just deep in the superconducting state, that's what I would expect. I deliberately didn't want this. I wanted the same critical calculation that would mean non thermal liquid behavior to be responsible for superconductivity, not some extra source of pairing. But in principle, you could do this. You get a giant gap if it's a strong coupling and then not much fluctuates around it because it's all gapped. Uh, so it is something you can solve and it could be relevant for many situations. It's just not something that I felt much compelled to do. So I have not much to say about it. Uh, so we have a last break and uh...